Well, Boogie, where'd you come from? The same stinking place you come from, Forsyth and Delancey. How are you? Well, get Boogie. Kid, you look like a success. The gangster film is the dark side of the American dream. The Depression comes along. There's a whole new class of gangster that comes out of that class of immigrants who suddenly have found a way to really have the American dream. You have to remember that at that time, the majority of moviegoers were immigrants. And so that they must have got a certain satisfaction from the fact that these characters were actually bettering themselves, albeit through the wrong means, by becoming gangsters, by sort of outwitting society as represented by the police. Maybe we shouldn't, Rocky. We don't need those pens. They ain't like stealing coal to keep warm. We can sell them, can't we? Yeah, but I don't... Now, listen. What we don't take, we ain't got. Come on, look around. See what you can find. Break that lock. The characters that came along did a number of things that were different than we had seen in movies before. People talked differently. They acted differently. They dressed differently. I think the role of ethnic Americans in cinema was greatly enhanced by gangster films and, and actors who played gangster roles. I think the gangster movies would have been pretty boring if there weren't some other personalities and other ideas came into it. Well, what it did for guys like me, and that was the first time we saw our neighborhood in a movie. If you must steal bread in New York, <clears throat> don't get caught. See those white lights up there? That's where you belong. That's where you're going. Come on, I'll show you what this town's made for. The promise of America was that there was a place you could come and make your fortune. There was a place where you could come and be a citizen, where you could have dignity. By your own effort, you could make something out of yourself. It takes a certain kind of person in a little Irish village, in a little Italian mountainside community, to say, you know, I think I'll go somewhere where I know nobody that has nothing and see what I can do. If you were coming over to America, you were coming over because you had an energy and the right to a dream. When they got here and it wasn't paved with gold, most of them stayed. It was unknown, but it gave you the belief that you could really do something. Look at the first gangsters, the Irish Catholics. They came here because of the potato famine, you know, a land of opportunity. And of course, the wasps who were here just put them down. And they had to buck that. I mean, that was the wasp that were the establishment. So they had to go against the establishment. I said, where do you live? No place. Oh, tramps, huh? Yeah, just traveling all over the country looking for work means being tramps. That's us. Joe, don't lose your head. What's the difference? I've been in courts before. I know the answer for guys like us. Yeah, but Joe, he might let us... You don't think he's going to give us a home and a job, do you? What they found when they got here is that they were a little bit late. It was difficult to get ahead in American society. So the early gangsters came from these three groups, from the Italians, the Irish, and the Jews. They set things up in New York and in Chicago and in other big cities. They began unlawfully making lots of money. Hey, boss, not bad. Well, my mother has to work almost all week to make this much. Yes, yes, yes. All right. For a lot of immigrants who came and were fish peddlers or, or tailors or rag pickers or whatever it was, they found a semi-legitimate life in the illegitimate life, in gangsters. They were somebody. They had access to a lot of the things that the people before them and their families never had. And so, yes, it was outside the law, nobody's perfect, but in fact, there was an equal opportunity to be seized in this great equal opportunity country. What earthly good is it for me to teach that honesty is the best policy when all around they see that dishonesty is a better policy? That the hoodlum and the gangster is looked up to with the same respect as the successful businessman or the popular hero. Uh, give me 7 of 42. I know I'm going to win today. <laughs> sure. I tell my wife this morning, I got a lock today, all right? There's always been this extraordinary uh, uh, feeling of uh, uh, kind of empathy in an odd way with the outlaw, the gangster, even more so in American society. And this is something that still sells. Duke Mantee and his gang are headed this way. Nobody will get Mantee. <laughs> you fool him. The earlier gangsters were very often men who were disillusioned. And Americans respond to that. Their mother went to church and were the good ladies and the sons didn't really want to say mom. Don't you understand, it isn't working here in this dream country. He acted like a dope. I was playing for peanuts. But from now on, I play for high stakes. I want nothing in my pocket either, see? 
and I'll chop off the hand of the first guy that tries to stop me. In the gangster film, one of the interesting things about it, it's always the other side of, of legitimate business. I mean, what you're watching is the forming of corporations, basically. And so what you're getting is this kind of oppositional pairing on one side of the law, on the other side of the law. Well, I wish I'd known when you quit. I'd like to fetch in the banking business. Oh, there isn't enough money in it. <laughs> <laughs> one of the interesting things in this regard is not to forget a lot of the gangster films, there are scenes in posh nightclubs. You can have a girl singer then. But those same nightclubs are, in a strange way, the setting for all the 30s musicals, you know, with Edward Everett Horton and Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. It's like this is the back of the nightclub. And very often, a lot of the gangster scenes take place in the back of a nightclub or a cabaret. <laughs> Haven't had much success. Nobody gets ahead fast when they play the game on the level. The gangster genre has appealed to people because of circumstances that the audience understood personally. The kind of prejudice against certain immigrant groups, particularly in cities. You've got to remember something about the children of immigrants. Most of those immigrants came here uh, the turn of the century, right up to the First World War. Many of them didn't speak English. And so when you grow up in that kind of a culture, you want to know what's going on out there. Who's around? Where do I go? What do I do? You didn't know what was happening around you. And you found out by going to the movies. You could never, under any circumstances, ever, ever, ever find out anything in school. You've got to remember, school was not to learn anything about life. And your parents barely spoke English. So they couldn't tell you what life was. I swore my daughter would never have to go through what I went through, skimping and saving penny by penny and losing it all and starving ever since. They couldn't even tell you how, if you wanted to go to college, how you got into a college. So these kids of the immigrants really had to scramble. That's you get the Jimmy Cagney energy. You had to scramble, get my ass out of here. How am I gonna get, how am I gonna get out? And you have to energize yourself. And I think that's what the movies brought to them. You saw America. You saw the country outside of your neighborhood on that screen. The movies were the great educational lesson. Don't you see, Danny? We're only hurting each other if we let ourselves into the lives like our families had. Always struggling, always trying to make a dime do for a dollar. I want to climb out of Forsyth Street. Come on, boys, take out the artillery. The gangster always seems to know exactly what to say and when to say it. And they, you know what? There's no hesitation. It just comes back at you. And so, you know, people want to be around someone like that because it makes you feel protective and protected. Power is always attractive. It's a primal thing that you see strength, power, and the ability to dominate and find that attractive. If you ain't out of town by tomorrow morning, you won't never leave it except in a pine box. I'm taking over this territory. Gangsters, uh, there's a mythology, and they're archetypal. They're, they're the shady guys, the dark guys, and they're very, very interesting to people because the good guys generally have no, no, no darkness whatsoever. So when you look at those wonderful movies with way, way, way back with Humphrey Bogart, James Cagney, um, generally those were bad guys with a moment of redemption. You know, and we loved watching that. He erases Lee. I'll remember that, Johnny. Good night. Good night, Johnny. One of the aspects that upset reformers so much about these movies is that unquestionably audiences went to see these films and they admired what these gangsters did, particularly for young kids growing up in the city, in poverty, without a whole lot of options about their future. He ain't no gangster. He's a real old-time desperado. Gangsters is foreigners, and he's an American. Wait till the sheriff finds out he's here, and we, we see some real killing. What'd we do? Gangster's usually attractive because see, he has money, he has success, he has women, and he loses his attractiveness when somebody kills him. The minute we see somebody with that power and the ability to bend somebody else, we want to associate with that. Come on, get up and let her keep your mouth shut. Almost all of these gangsters started in their own community oppressing their own people. 
and his strength and his conviction comes from his ability to oppress his own. The gangster or the stick-up guy, I mean, that's not your money in your safe in, in your liquor store. No, no, that's his money, and it's in your safe. And he's going to get his money out of your safe and out of your pocket. That's the key. That's the little metal switch that clicks on, and he's and so when you refuse to give him his money, that's why he gets mad and shoots you. He's one of Paddy Ryan's gang, but that's not all. Sure, they stop at nothing. You either take their beer or they put you on the spot. Some members of the audience didn't want to see their particular ethnic group portrayed as criminals, as mobsters and there were a lot of protests against some of these early films but there was a huge audience for these films as well the whole gangster genre really changed from the teens through the 20s and 30s he's now going out after the people who can really afford to be robbed the rich who have insurance and so it's not really going to hurt them to take the money or the jewels from their safe or whatever so audiences sort of became more and more comfortable with the gangster genre because they felt that they, the poor strata of society, were not being threatened by these gangsters. Nice country around here. They can open up a bank. Maybe a couple of them. You haven't lost your gentle touch, have you? I think Cagney and Bogart and Robinson opened the world for future gangsters by being successful at it. Uh, portraying it in a way that made people want to go see those films made it a popular form of entertainment through the 30s and into the 40s. Hollywood itself, of course, is the product of immigrants when you think of it. Most of the producers and directors were uh, European, and many of them were European refugees. And you have, therefore, a tremendous European flavor and contribution to these films right from the get-go. Well, how are you going to leave? Hands and a camera. It brought me luck already. Maybe it'll bring me some more. You know, Cagney and Robinson were really able, I think, to show the mannerisms of their childhood. They hadn't forgotten the toughness of their youth. They knew the audience who was watching them. They knew the people still talk like that, who still felt like that, who dressed like that in some ways. And I think they had a very great sense of being able to relate back to the home. I think Edward G. Robinson, for instance, did have a rather difficult time grappling with his Jewishness. And of course, the name change is pretty glaring. Emmanuel Goldenberg becomes Edward G. Robinson, you know, the ultimate sort of Anglo-Saxon white bread name. You just watch Marco sail ahead. Imagine us being legitimate after all these years. Cagney, on the other hand, loved being Irish. To him, being Irish was a gift straight from God. How was the main event? Ah, uh, they should have had you in the ring. That was a sweet punch, Johnny. And he had it coming to him. Edward G. Robinson grew up not really in dire circumstances. He was an immigrant into the United States, and he aspired from early on to be one of the great Shakespearean actors. He got into the movies in the early sound days because he had great theatrical training, and one of the first roles that he played, of course, was Rico in Little Caesar. He was an actor of incredible range, but it was difficult for him to kind of shake off the gangster persona that was established in that early film. Hey, I could do all the things that fella does and more. Only I never got my chance. Why was there to be afraid of? And when I get in a tight spot, I shoot my way out of it. Why, sure. Shoot first and argue afterwards. Cagney grew up on the streets of New York. He was a street kid. Born in 1899 in the Lower East Side of New York City, son of a, a bartender, and that was rough, carrying pails here, there, and everywhere. Street fights along with his sister and brother on his side. Cagney, of course, was very Irish and was a member of the so-called Irish Mafia, which he never liked that title, by the way. He always called it the Boys Club for some reason. A lot of the things that he does in his films, he mimics characters that he grew up with. And so a lot of the gestures and the tics and the other things that are so marvelous in his performances were things that he picked up on the street. Morning, gentlemen. Nice day for murder. Where's Frazier? Where's that hundred grand? He wants to go on the stage and he wants to be a dancer. He doesn't go to dancing school, he teaches himself. I mean, that's his life. 
He is a doer. He is a doer. He's always in action. Jimmy Cagney, although he was Irish, did speak Yiddish. And in fact, there's at least one film in which he speaks Yiddish on screen. Who's going to Ellis Island? The vibe is doing. What then? You say Yiddish in you. No, who's then? I shake it. And audiences really loved that when he did it. Most of them probably thought that he was taught that, but he actually knew it, in fact, in real life. What part of Ireland did your folks come from? <laughs> the Lenty Street, thank you. The gangster wants status. It's usually the little guy who rises through the ranks or takes over the mob. Oh, masters, I'll be back tomorrow night to pick up that check. There's also the scrappiness, you know, that, that's about street smarts, about dealing with everyday life, which comes through in these films. I think it's really interesting, the immigrant status, because that disappears, it seems, with Cagney and Robinson once they become big stars, is they're little guys. I mean, physically short little guys. And there's something incredibly appealing about that because they're figuring the revenge of the little guy so that everyone sitting in the audience is likely more to feel like a little guy. And I think the identification tends to come through that more so than any particular kind of immigrant identification. Why did you try to take over the job? I didn't try and take it over, I took it over. Did you think we might object? Well, why should you? I've proven to you that I could run it better than anyone else. Fenner isn't any good. Yes, you've given us quite a nice bit of revenue. Well, I've given you more than any four of them put together. And you'll keep on getting it, provided you give me a few breaks. You know, I'm not in this for fun. I asked Edward G. Robinson one time when I met him, I said, Did, uh, who was tougher, you or Bogart? He said, what do you mean? I killed Bogey three times, you only killed me once. That's what he actually said to me. And then it was a party and it was balloons, and he started popping the balloons with his cigar. And he said, I feel mean tonight. Want to see me do that again? And he pushed another one. And I said, this, what could be greater than to meet Edward G. Robinson and have him actually do himself for you, you know? Darling, I love you enough to give up anything. And I want to get you as far away from this hoodlum life as possible. If you look at the earliest gangster films, the, the films that were made back in the early 19-teens, D.W. Griffith's Musketeers of Pig Alley and so forth, the gangsters are pure thugs. They're just nasty, swarthy, unpleasant uh, kinds of individuals. They're the other that has to be kind of overcome for American society to be safe for all the good people. As time went on, though, they began to show gangsters in a somewhat more expansive way. I'll get out. A few more years in this prison, I'll have enough dough stolen by so we can settle down and forget all this. The characters that Bogart, Edward G. Robinson, James Cagney played were anti-hero heroes, men who lived uh, by a code of crime, but yet it was a code, and it, it had, within its own context, a great deal of honor. By the way, from now on, you're going to be the big boss. What I love was there's something that's absolute hellhole. People are shooting each other, but they go to nightclubs. There's a sense of a kind of vibrant desperation to uh, have uh, an enjoyment of some kind, uh, uh, enjoy life. And they have no education. They're stuck. They're in a place where, you know, the first form of communication is a gun, basically. And I, I find that that's, that's something that carries over to, to any society once a society breaks down, really. What we try to do with Goodfellas is when, when, when we all worked on the script, when Nick Pelleggi and Marty Scorsese and I when we worked on the script, the idea we always had was to present a group of gangsters who you liked. These were really, really nice guys. You want to hang out with them. And then you realize halfway into the film that they're terrible people, that they go around killing people for no reason. So you're lulled for the first part of that film, which is what I think you were with a lot of the early gangster films. You were lulled into liking them, and then you would see what they really looked like. The rise of the gangster is a success story. You watch a lone individual come up, pull himself up from his bootstraps, talk about, you know, the kind of immigrant beginnings. It's all about American values of being self-reliant. But with the gangster, we learn that going after this American dream in some ways has its price. One, you end up at the top of the heap, then somebody wants to bump you off. So, the success is tragic. Is this the end of Rico? And the audience can then sort of pull back and say, well, maybe it's not so good to pick myself out of a crowd, because I'll just end up alone. 
if not shot and, you know, rolled into the streets. So there's a kind of complex relation here to the American success story. I was a dizzy dope. I was going to burn up the world. I got burned myself. Ever watch a moth fly in the flame? Can't stop until their wings burn off. That's the sort of wonderful synergy that you get in these movies, you know. They are distinctly American, and yet you have this kaleidoscope almost of ethnic and national backgrounds being poured into the cinema pot that was Hollywood at that time. Goodbye, mate. Buona fortuna.